There's blood flowing from the bottom of the door. I could hear Pancake scream on the other side of the door and I was just so scared I woke up. All she did was stare at me and say, give me reasons I should continue leaving. And then the soldiers walked out. Uh, knowing that they were dead and speaking to them was uh, a bit freaky for me. One day, when I was 12, I came home from school feeling exhausted. I took a nap and was late for my swimming class. As I was in a rush, I did not warm up before I started to swim. When I was swimming the fourth lap, my whole body froze and I started to drown. I couldn't breathe. I saw my instructor coming towards me. Then I blacked out. When I opened my eyes, I saw people trying to revive me from a top view. I felt funny as if something was waiting for me from above. White light surrounded me and I was oaring in the air. I floated higher and higher, then something pulled me back to the ground. Then I woke up and I coughed and vomited water. And then at the journey, you, you go a little bit high, then you start rasa macam disedut to bawah. According to the International Associations of Near-Death Studies, surveys taken in the United States, Australia and Germany suggest that 4 to 15 percent of the population have had near-death experiences. I believe that a human being is a combination of the physical body and the soul. As I seeked for a biological explanation for near-death experiences, I discovered some interesting information about a certain gland in our body, called the pineal gland. The pineal gland is a tiny pine cone shaped endocrine gland found in the brain and this is where many people believe is the location of the third eye as well as the door for the soul to go in and out. Jen Lim, a new age spiritual practitioner who has a gift to see what others cannot see, has personally seen with her third eye how her mother had left her body and returned to it. I have a very, very personal experience, which is my mom. Actually, she was uh, suffering from acute pancreatitis just about nine months ago, and everything went sepsis, toxic. Um, she was going into unconscious, and we rushed her down to the HDU, and all I did was I stand there, and my mom's soul just came out of her body. All she did was stare at me and say, give me reasons I should continue leaving. And then the soul just walked out. I astro travel, I asked uh, friends, masters to astro travel to try to find her. And at the end, we found her. We talked to her, we request and everything. And her soul made a decision to come back. And then I saw it was through the third eye that she returned. And sure enough, the next day, she wakes up in the morning. In a blog article by His Eminence Tem Rinpoche, mm -hmm. there is an article on pineal gland and it says that um, the pineal gland is involved with the sixth chakra. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that? We have seven chakras in the body. The pineal gland, like you say, is the sixth chakra. It is then opposite in um, direction to the sacral chakra, which is the second chakra. So they actually matches each other. So there's a lot of practices in Indian practice, uh, yogis especially, where they activate the kundalini energy from your sacral chakra and they have it spin upwards all the way to the pineal gland or your third eye chakra to open it up and therefore they can travel or they can see another dimension. So there are some people who travel to hell, travel to heaven, travels to angelic realm, what are the practices or methods that people will use to activate the pineal gland? One of the practices that a lot of people now likes to do is to actually engage in the sun gazing exercise or sun gazing meditation. The natural sunlight would actually activate your pineal gland. Uh, secondly, you can also engage in um, scent, smell, 
Um, that's why we do incense during meditation. Right. Essential oils. Um, the third one is sound using sound and mantra to activate the pineal gland. So some people will chant OM. Well, the fourth practice which is most common is what we call meditation or yoga. Something that slows down your body and that really helps open up the pineal gland into another dimension. So when the pineal gland is active, mm -hmm. one could engage effectively in other body experiences. Mm -hmm. One could possibly be highly psychic, mm -hmm. that's the case in everybody is uh, having an out-of-body experience all the time. Actually, all of us will experience an out-of-body experience. That is during our sleep time. The only thing I would like to add in this is that for an out-of-body experience practitioner or someone who wants to activate their pineal gland, there is also something that you need to learn that is a grounding means knowing how to come back to your body, how to live on earth and not always just in the air. According to Jen, an out-of-body experience is a happy one as you don't feel any physical pain at all. However, leaving the body for too long opens up the chances for the body to be possessed by other beings or that one may be unable to return into one's own body completely. Is the activation of the pineal gland beneficial to us? They have another eye on top of their head that well, this unique structure must be the seat of the soul. Many years ago, I went to Canada. While I was there, I had a heart attack. I felt that my heart had stopped. I experienced a pleasant sensation and light feeling, like I was floating above my body. When I turned around and looked down, I could see my own body lying on the bed in the hospital, and the nurse kept calling my name. I remember at the moment, I thought of my mother, and suddenly, I felt myself come down to the body, and I woke up. Is near-death or other body experiences related to the pineal gland, a pine cone-shaped organ in our brain? If you study through history, you can find how this pine cone-shaped gland is depicted by different cultures. The Pigna sculpture sits in the Vatican courtyard called the Court of the Pine Cone and is considered the largest pine cone statue in the world today. On the back of the US dollar, there is a symbol that is called the All-Seeing Eye and it is believed to be a representation of the pineal gland. To understand this pine cone symbolism further, I travel to Singapore to meet Professor Xie, a cognitive neuroscientist who may be able to offer a scientific explanation on the pineal gland. Pineal gland is a small structure sitting in the middle of the brain. It's part of the endocrine gland system. And the first one is that it will release a hormone called melatonin, and which regulates our biological clock, like such as the seasonal rhythm or the circadian rhythm, like our sleep-wake cycle. Another function of the pineal gland is that it communicates with another brain region called the pituitary gland. So where does this theory that the pineal gland is the third eye come about? In human, actually, the pineal gland responds to light indirectly. So meaning that the, the light will come into our eye first and then go to a brain region called suprachiasmatic nuclei and then send the information to the pineal gland. But interestingly, in some of the lower vertebrae, they have another eye on top of their head. And this eye is directly linked to the pineal gland. Okay, and some people call this the third eye. And the function of this third eye is to let these animals detect subtle changes in sunlight so that they can better adjust their biological clock. I think historically, the pineal gland is taken a bit uh, spiritually and uh, mystically, and there are for a few reasons. The first is that, uh, for some of the 17th century philosopher René Descartes, he discovered that the only non-paired structure in the middle of the brain is the pineal gland. He therefore thought that uh, this unique structure must be the seed of the soul. Would you say that there is sufficient scientific research to actually say, yep, 
the pineal gland is associated with the third eye and the growth of their spiritual path. To my knowledge, currently there's no um, enough evidence supporting this idea, supporting the idea that the, the pineal gland is the inner third eye in humans. But as um, professor and as an investigator yourself, what's your personal take on it? Right, so I think as a scientist, I would like to keep my mind open to all kinds of possibility. I think, well, the theory may make sense, right, because there's some historical link, but there's no evidence proof or disapprove this idea, so it's inconclusive at this stage. Statistics has shown that many people actually have out-of-body experiences, some even near-death experiences where they actually are able to be out of their body and they see in, and but they, they come back. Is there any correlation with what you study, the consciousness and, and the cognition? Today, we have more and more evidence showing that near-death experience is associated with a few things like um, lack of oxygen in the brain and elevated carbon dioxide and also excessive hormone and neurotransmitter like endorphin and serotonin in the brain. And experimentally, it's been shown that if you change the chemical concentration of these substances in the brain, you will be able to induce near-death experience. And also, there are recent neurostimulation and neuroimaging experiments showing that um, near-death experience is associated with abnormal activity in temporal lobe and hippocampus and temporal parietal junction. So these are the region in the brain responsible for memory and uh, multi-sensory integration. Okay, so you can see that while well, this can probably explain the memory flashback, right? And this hallucination experience is observed in near-death experiences. Out-of-body experiences can be simulated through a neural experiment. But what simulates it when there are no other people in the lab? Our own fears? Our faith? Or is there a life message that we need to embrace? The first experience I had, uh, it was quite a horrible nightmare. I was stuck in a room in an asylum. The walls were dirty and the door is metal and rusty and all this blood flowing from the bottom of the door. I could hear bangs and scream on the other side of the door and I was just so scared I woke up. So eventually, I just practiced meditation, breathing, just to fall back asleep. Once I got back into the sleep, I actually got back into the nightmare. But because I had that moment where I woke up in between, I just had this realization, oh, I'm in a nightmare. I'm not just living this. This is a dream. So I have control. So I turned around. And as I turned around, then a, a very beautiful wooden window appeared with nice curtains. So I chose this other path, this path of just happiness and colors, and it, the atmosphere completely changed. As I started to collect the testimonials of near-death and out-of-body experiences, I found out that out-of-body experience is a skill that you can learn and practice. Yuri Zaritsky, a Ukrainian who has made Malaysia his home, has had more than 600 out-of-body experiences. The experiences amazed him so much that he has organized workshops and classes to share his experiences with others. So it was about 15 years ago that you had your point of no return and had your first experience. So how could you tell it was an out-of-body experience and not just merely a dream? Oh, my uh, first one was in Bukit Bintang in uh, Malaysia. <laughs> Once I was in front of this experience, every, even simple things seem amazing. It's not about what's going on around, it's about uh, how I perceive things. You know, and the way the person perceived things, especially at the beginning, for the first time, it's overwhelming. Where were you physically? My body was in my bed. When you were looking at Bukit Bintang Road, were you floating, flying, walking? Are you seeing yourself or are you in first person? I was in the first person, I didn't fly, I just walk around. Walking around in the dream state, being conscious, it's really something. <laughs> What is OP? Is it real? Is it imagination?
dream state, being conscious, it's really something. <laughs> Yuri is a practitioner of lucid dreaming and out-of-body experiences for the past 15 years. According to him, in order to have an out-of-body experience, lucid dreaming is usually the first step that one needs to master because this is how one can learn to separate the consciousness from the physical body. And I am most curious about this. Awareness is how many things, how much information can you take in. So maybe you are sitting and only aware of yourself and suddenly you hear a bird chirping, so you could say, I am aware of the bird chirping. Lucid dreaming means that one is made to be aware that one is in fact dreaming. Well, for me, dreaming could be our own personal imagination. Imagination and reality. Where do we draw the line? Or are there no lines? I would say there is no line. There is no one who could be uh, capable to clearly explain that line. Uh, we can find theories about it, but we will not have a physical proof of everything that uh, people bring from there. There are techniques and practices uh, which are accessible to absolutely everyone and you don't need to do meditation, relaxation, yoga or, or any spiritual practice. You're gonna learn the technique today. It's called phantom movement. You're gonna take your maximum hours of sleep. Let's say you can sleep for eight hours. You're gonna minus from these eight hours three hours. You can practice it with any part of your body. Let's say I'm doing it with my hand. You can move your hand in any direction, up, down, left, right. You will try to move your head without moving your physical muscles. Usually people think, okay, the out-of-body or lucid dreaming is reserved for some kind of special people with some special powers or mystics, you know. Uh, but in reality, every single person go to sleep at night and having some dreams. So when I teach it to other people, I'm not bringing them to a new location. I'm only telling them now the difference is your relationship with the dream experience. In what way? Is it a way of getting to know yourself better, answer some questions, inner demons? When the person is not being conscious, the behavior of the person, I would say, is more emotional, driven. So the person is in a certain situation, the person will react, reaction. When the person is conscious, it is not a reaction anymore because the person knows I am in the dream and I do not need to react, I can act. And that is very different because the person starts to direct itself into whatever experience they wish to have. So I can consciously direct myself into any kind of experiences. We're gonna run through the whole algorithm, separation, Phantom movement, listening in, uh, fake falling asleep. That is one cycle. Every technique we are doing is only five seconds, each of them, okay? So let's uh, put ourselves uh, comfortable. Okay, but you ready? Just imagine you are lying down. So imagine you already woke up after the alarm, you already went back to the bed, you fall asleep. Now you have another natural awakening. Boom. Separation technique. So I try to stand up without moving my body. It doesn't work, move to the phantom movement. Now try to move your head up, 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 come back to the middle. Down, 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 come. Right after the class, I tried it on the first night. What happened was, I remember talking to two people who had already died. And one was my uncle and one was my grandmother. I was able to control my speech, yes. So I think, uh, in a way, I was somewhat conscious. After yesterday's training with Yuri on the techniques of out-of-body experiences, and I wanted to explore and feel it for myself. Unfortunately, I was not successful, but that's not the point. The point is, what is OBE? Is it real? Is it imagination? So what we've done at the Paranormal Zone is we've set up something in order for us to continue to explore. What we did was we placed a card in this room on the table, face down. We locked the room and no one has been in since. Something is written on this card. And the participants, including myself, after the training with Yuri, were told to come and see 
what's written on the card. So I was unsuccessful in getting here with my OBE experience or attempt. What happened for you? I did manage to project and uh, I got the queen of uh, spade. So during your out-of-body experience coming to see this card, was this the same environment that you saw? I used teleportation. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a well-known technique in, uh, in OBE. You, you can use a door and behind the door you can find the location. So when I opened my door, it was the door that we see here and I entered the meeting room. So the door you uh, saw yeah, the is door, this one? I, I guess it's, uh, it's the regular door and uh, the table was uh, following the... It was parallel to, to the walls though. You see oh. there, there are some changes. Did uh, you? No, I didn't see any warning sign. Oh. Okay, so now let's go inside and see what's on the card. Shall we? <laughs> okay. Okay, let's have a look at what the card is. Oh! So it's not a card at all. It's, uh, it's a sign. So you have an eye and a star. So I probably thought that it is a card to like a playing card, you see? So, uh, so probably I got influenced. We could have influenced you to be rather biased as opposed to having a free travel or free-minded uh, experience. It's not because I have uh, 600 OBEs behind my back that I become professional in finding this kind of information. I actually never trained for that, you know, so I, I accepted the challenge that that's okay. Does this test or experiment tell us that OBE is rubbish, does not exist? I don't think so. But what it has done is made me think and ask more. Is out-of-body experience more about imagination? Or is it what they say, a reality? Or is the mind simply just playing tricks on us? The Paranormal Zone continues to investigate more out-of-body experiences in the next episode. Follow us as we travel to Taiwan in search of the paranormal experiences. Stay tuned.